Rugby in Wales is more than just a game, it's a religion, an obsession. It is in fact impossible to overstate its significance. The importance of rugby in Wales is such that you can't really imagine the history of modern Wales without understanding the history of rugby. It's as big as that. It says something about the kind of society that grew up after the 1880s in industrial and urban Wales. And it became an expression of people's national identity. The, the oddity in Wales is that it rapidly became a game identified with the working class areas and particularly with the South Wales coalfield. And when we understand why that happened, we begin to understand why rugby took off like a rocket. And it took off like a rocket because what was happening to Welsh society was without precedent within the British Isles. More people were coming into Wales than any other part of the British Isles. It was an immigrant society. But also in South Wales, you had the influx of rural workers from West Wales and North Wales. And all because of steel, iron before that, and of course after the 1880s, the explosion of the steam coal field of the South Wales Valleys. What happened then was that the rugby game that had been played in the coastal towns of Cardiff and Ethley and Newport was picked up by these working men uh, in very rough and often haphazard conditions, changing in public houses, uh, playing on what were essentially waste ground, but becoming a local product, identifying the game with your village, with your patch. And out of that kind of intense pride, 1880s, 1890s, came suddenly this sort of mushroom growth of teams right across South Wales. What you get is a working man's interest in the game, turning it into a spectator sport. So then associated with the game come the other things with that industrial working class. Gambling, uh, drinking, and passion. And when that happens and the newspapers begin to take up the story of the game, then, yeah, a certain kind of pride begins to grow. And you suddenly have crowds for Welsh club rugby games, certainly by the end of the 1880s, um, far larger than, than any English equivalents. And gate money is being taken. Now, where's this gate money going? Um, and, and in what sense is that helping to build the game up in Wales beyond a certain point? The actual Welsh Rugby Union, or Football Union, as it was initially called, was set up in 1881 at the Castle Hotel in Neath. The prime mover behind the formation of the Union was Richard Mullock of Newport. Basically, the idea was for the Welsh, as an official body, to test themselves against other countries, notably England. The men who had established the game in Wales in the 1880s wanted to play England, Scotland and Ireland as a nation. And the only way they can really do that is by maintaining the support of a population big enough to give them um, an equality. And so they, they kind of twist the rules a bit. And you have, certainly by the beginning of the 20th century, shamaterism within Wales. You have a game which is run by amateurs, it's administered by amateurs, it's played by and large by working men, but there are under the counter or in the boot payments. And there is, of course, enormous conflict between the, the rough and ready aspects of the Welsh game and the rather grander English and Scottish equivalents. The first international against England was played on the 19th of February, 1881. England won, of course, at the canter. It was not until 1890 that Wales narrowly defeated England, one try to nil at Dewsbury. But the Welsh clubs, and indeed the national team, soon put their individual stamp on the game. Now, Wales, of course, doesn't beat England in that first decade. There's a draw, um, they sneak a victory in Dewsbury. But it's not until 1893 that they really show the worth of the fourth three-quarter game in, in the great and epic game uh, in which Wales wins its first triple crown in 1893 and, in fact, beats England for the first time on Welsh soil. And I think at, at that point, the Welsh have established that they will be the, the leaders in the development of the game's first 20 years. From the beginning, Newport was the strongest club in the country, and in the 1890s, they possessed the greatest player, the legendary A.J. Gould. He was the first superstar of Welsh rugby. He was probably the first superstar in the rugby game as a whole. I mean, when he retired in 1896, he had kicked more goals, scored more tries, played in more games than any other recorded player to that point. On top of all that, of course, he was um, devastatingly, enviably handsome. And, of course, when he finally retired, having taken Wales to the heights almost, certainly to the beginning of what was going to be the first golden era of Welsh rugby, he had done two things. He had marked out a new style of play, swift 
uh, intelligent, snapping at the ball, as he put it. He was a graceful and sinuous runner. Uh, he was a, a, the kind of player that, that people literally paid to come to see if he was playing rather than just supporting the club. So he had all of those, that aura around him. And uh, the, the gentlemen of Wales decide to get up a fund in his honour when he retires um, and they start a shilling fund on the Cardiff Coal Exchange and money is raised to buy the great A.J. Gould a house in Newport, a, a splendid Victorian villa. And the other countries, particularly Scotland, England also, uh, are absolutely furious and see this as breaking all of the rules and bringing the whole amateur ethos of the game, which, remember, makes it a middle-class game and gives it distinction in their eyes, uh, bringing that into, into the gutter. And Wales actually holds firm on this one um, and refuses to, to be bullied. And Gould's house is bought and there's a wonderful presentation dinner in 1896 and so on. And what happens is that... Um, England, Scotland and Ireland refuse to play Wales. In fact, Scotland doesn't play them, I think, for over two seasons. Um, Ireland and England back out for a while. And it's the English clubs that force the English Union, the, the Rugby Football Union, back into, uh, into playing with Wales because they are relishing at this point their meeting with the Welsh teams. They're getting better games, they're getting more exciting games, they're getting bigger crowds, and they themselves, of course, in club terms, are getting more money. So Gould is right at the cusp of this period and in a sense the Gould Affair as it was called marks out uh, a kind of a Welsh independence and also an acceptance by the other unions that Wales is halfway house between Northern Union or Rugby League, professional rugby and mm, a slightly shady amateurism will be acceptable as long as the eyes are averted and nobody pays too much attention um, to a, a few of the anomalies in the Welsh game. What they really resent, however, by the turn of the 20th century, is that Wales begins consistently to beat them because they're playing hard, strong, fit, working-class men. Uh, and the class resentment against Welsh rugby at that stage is as much to do, literally, with issues of social class as it is to do with money. From 1900 to 1911, Wales win the Triple Crown six times and dominate the era. This is a great team with players that remain household names to this day. The crowds that flocked to see the early games of Welsh rugby were soon flocking to see personalities, great players, as well as the results of the game. Obviously Gould, uh, Billy Bancroft, the fullback from Swansea, who went on to play forever and ever, it seemed, the, the incredible James brothers, Evan and David James, the curly-headed marmosettes, as they were called, who used to do tricks on the field of play, acrobatic tricks. Um, this was almost like a circus, almost like a music hall. And then in the first golden era, it's not just one or two players who were picked out, but you can suddenly talk about dozens of them, and certainly eight or nine that I think would be world class at any era. And of course, nobody alive now has seen these people play, and we can only rely upon newspaper accounts and, and memories. But the same kinds of things keep coming through, that there was great individual playing ability, but sunk within a team spirit. It's Nichols, if you want, that exemplifies the team spirit, the precision. But Dickie Owen, the tiny little scrum half from Swansea, um, you know, a, a, a midget of a man in a sense in today's play, but absolutely rock hard, tough, um, and, and a man who takes on these opposing forwards. Imagine how the crowds would have loved that, you know, gallant little Wales. And then um, a string of outside halves. I suppose Percy Bush would be the one that would most come to mind now. Um, Daisy, as he was sometimes called. Percy Bush, who was a twinkling, um, an epitome of what we would later understand to be a Welsh outside half. The great Billy True, again of Swansea, who could play on the wing in the centre at outside half. A man who was uh, kind of the ghost in the machine. You never quite knew where he was turning up. Uh, it was said that he could double up and jump over opposing players. True went on to Captain Wales many, many times in that golden era when they win oh, six Triple Crowns, uh, 1900 down to 1911. For all these great players, however, the key name from this era is Gwyn Nichols. If AJ Gould was the great individual, then Gwyn Nichols was the team player, adding science and intellect to the natural ability of players like Owen and True. But the crowning moment in Gwyn Nichols' career was also probably the most famous match in the history of Welsh rugby. 
Welsh rugby came of age, became truly the national game of Wales quite early on. I'd say December the 16th, 1905. It's the clash, of course, between the all-conquering All Blacks from New Zealand and Wales. It's a game that's echoed through the rugby traditions of both those countries ever since. But at the time, even, people understood that it was a kind of a world championship. 48,000 people pour into Cardiff Arms Park to see the game, even though I think lots of them didn't see it because it was so foggy and misty. It was a, a team, if you like, waiting to meet its nemesis. The All Blacks had beaten everybody, and they had conquered. They had cut a swathe through, through English rugby. So they come to Wales unbeaten, uh, and everybody knows that the outcome of this game is going to say who's at the top of the tree. But there's something else, of course. The Zealand are coming as the colonials, as the sons of the open air, uh, uh, the new race that is being built uh, on the other side of the globe. Wales, at the same time, are an ancient nation, but one which, through industry, has modernised itself. So you had a clash of cultures as well, and people were aware of that, both in New Zealand and in Wales. International rugby match was played that has become woven into the history of two countries. Each nation, in population terms much the same, had been created anew in the 19th century and in recent years had come to express their identity eloquently on the rugby field. Wales were champions of Europe, New Zealand the best in the southern hemisphere, but they'd never met. No game has generated such an electrical sense of expectancy as the first time that Wales and New Zealand met on the rugby field in 1905 for the championship of the world. There are very few photos of the big game, just a few that give us an idea of the tension that was choking the Arms Park that misty December afternoon. There's some rare footage of the All Blacks taking the field somewhere. In Swansea, maybe in Cardiff. But this clip apart, there's nothing that enables us to see what happened in this first encounter between the two countries. But the papers were full of it, which is hardly surprising, since it was being billed as the game to decide the rugby championship of the world. How big is the crowd? Some say 50,000 people have gathered here, all of them shouting or singing. The atmosphere inside the ground and on the streets outside is electric. It was now Wales's turn to take on the mighty New Zealanders. The World Championship in Rugby was about to be decided. It was a last-minute idea, since there was, in those days, no official singing of the anthem before the kick-off. 
and to the play's astonishment, the crowd joined in. Over 40,000 voices. The effect was electrifying, and the visitors were staggered. Their captain said later he would never forget it. And that's how a famous Arms Park ritual began. For the first half hour, honours were even. The play on both sides was committed and ferocious. The Welsh scrum did more than just stand its ground. Every player on the Welsh side tackled relentlessly, and the All Blacks were prevented from developing their usual momentum. The fullback Winfield defended and kicked brilliantly, and the pace of the game surprised the crowd. Bush got close with a drop goal, and the ball slipped out of Llewellyn's grasp when he had a clear run to the line. So far, Wales were getting the better of the play. Boys, back. the tension was unbearable. Or as one of my fellow journalists said, this is a nice tetherboard of meat, blood and sinew. And then the outcome. Wales score a try. It's a planned move. The sneaky, incomparable Dickie Owen faints to go one way. Nichols sends his three quarters off with them. They've got somebody out of the pack, Cliff Pritchard. Uh, the ball is switched to the left, and Teddy Morgan, the fastest sprinter in the world, as Arthur Gould is screaming from his seat uh, with the press. The fastest sprinter in the world has scored 3 0 to Wales. And then, after half an hour's play, came the move that would lead to an immortal try for Wales. For the first time on their tour, the All Blacks had conceded a try before scoring themselves. Here we have Pritchard circled, who hadn't received the ball for 25 minutes, and that was for a good reason, and Gallagher, the roving forward for New Zealand. I just watch the top of your screen. Gwynnicka, the centre, goes across and drags Hunter with him, but also drags Gallagher, there he is, out of position. And Owens, the scrum half of Wales, realises that, gives the ball back to Pritchard, now, where Gallagher should have been, he would have gone and taken Pritchard. The centre then would have gone to the centre, and the winger would have gone to the opposite winger. Unfortunately, there's an overlap. There's Pritchard, straightens up and gives. The centre straightens up. Beautifully timed pass, and now Morgan is away with 22 metres to go. Pins his ears back, no one in front of him. The New Zealand fullback comes across Gillette but doesn't make it valiant effort, it's a great try for Wales. It 
excitement was at fever heat. Never before or since have I known anything like it. Some of us were so affected we could hardly speak or write. The very air was charged with emotion. Hopes and fears were blended in an aching, choking anxiety. The second half began as the first half had ended, with the All Blacks steadily increasing the pressure. They were determined in attack, and once again Wales had to defend heroically. As both teams foresaw the All Blacks' defeat, the play became more physical and resolute. was an Homeric contest of skill, endurance, and sheer brute strength. The hardest, cleanest struggle that I can remember. For how long could Wales keep them out? Now came what could have been the turning point of the game. Teddy Morgan's try is, of course, to be the only score of the game. Wales has other chances. Uh, Willie Llewellyn muffs one. But the game hinges in the end, in mythology anyway, on the try that never was. Or maybe the try that was scored, as New Zealanders would have it. Uh, New Zealand break away out of defence, and Dean's huge strapping guy is suddenly herring for the line, uh, and he's definitely going to score under the post. And then accounts of what happened vary, but he veered inwards so that he would actually score under the post, and in doing so, um, he's tackled uh, from behind by Teddy Morgan. And the question is, did he make a second movement, which in those days certainly was illegal? Did he put the ball over the line after he'd been stopped? Um, he says no, that he grounded the ball over the line. Um, Teddy Morgan's actually cor corroborated that and said he thought Deans had scored. Uh, others who would run up, including Percy Bush, says they saw Deans make the double movement. Uh, and the referee, uh, a Scotsman, God bless him, uh, of course, doesn't give the try. Uh, I'm pretty convinced from studying all of the evidence that the referee was right, that he was up with play, and that Deans, although he may well have thought he'd scored, hadn't. A speculative kick ahead by Wales was fielded by Wallace deep on the left. And as he ran out of defence, Deans went with him. New Zealand nearly scored, and some of the Colonials assert they should have been awarded a try. This was when Wallace made a grand run on the left. He received the ball from a kick and with head down, started off at pace. Llewellyn ran to meet him with a view of holding him. At the same moment, Wallace passed Deans. Morgan sprinted across from the left wing and helped Gabe to save what otherwise would have been a certain try. With the end of the game drawing ever closer, Wales was straining every sinew. Bush went close again with a drop goal attempt for Wales. Roberts, Deans and Hunter counter-attacked for the All Blacks. Then Wales swept down the field. Nichols kicked forward and Gillett, the All Blacks fullback, was tackled on his line. New Zealand cleared up field, but Winfield kicked back and found touch a yard from the All Blacks line. By then, it was too late for them to strike back. The game was over!
gallant little Wales has immortalized herself. All hail to the brilliant Welshmen who have defeated the strongest team ever to visit this land. You have saved the credit of British football, and the victory is all the greater in that it was the smallest community in the British Isles which achieved it. Mine a bell? A two place. Got you there? Yeah. Some may say rugby football is only a game, but it has brought honor and fame to individuals, and it still matters more than anything almost to two proud nations. That was the position when I gave the signal for the movement. Bush, myself, and Wellen running to the right side of the field, as if the attack was to be delivered there. But we were only the decoy. Out it came, Dickie Owen changed his direction and delivered one of his famous reverse pass, Cliff Pritchett. And I got it. It was a beauty. I went straight ahead, and Rhys Gabe was chasing along, and I threw him a pass. And a very good one it was, Cliff. I took it easily, raced a dozen yards or so, and then handed it to Teddy Morgan. And as I took the perfect pass from Gabe, I saw Gillette, the New Zealand fullback, coming across to tackle me. By a shortening of stride and a look inwards, I caused him to hesitate. And that enabled me to get in at the corner, Gillette shooting right over me into touch and go.